Before we get to the movie, I want to tell you about something that I found in my various wanderings through the internet. Yes. Have you ever heard of a movie called The Mouse and His Child? No. It's an animated movie. It came out in 1977. And it is Toy Story. These two toy mice are unpacked in a toy shop. And they meet all these other toys because they all talk late at night. And the mouse dad proposes that they all become a family. Just like Woody and the gang. The mouse and his child accidentally get thrown away. And they go to the dump. Oh, and they Toy have Story pro- 3. And they have problems at the dump. Yeah. Very many similarities to the Toy Story saga. I can't help but think that John Lasseter was influenced by the mouse and his child. The reason you probably haven't heard of the mouse and his child is a pretty terrible title. And it got pretty bad reviews. Uh, Even Leonard Maltin hated it. And that guy likes everything. He gave two stars to Amadeus. For some reason, this is branded in my brain. Maybe the only movie that's won an Oscar that every single person likes. Two stars! I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Well, today your ears will get a rest and your eyes will get a workout because we're watching a silent film. I want you to engage your SAT brain right now and complete this sequence. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, blank. Harold Lloyd. Correct. And I hope that you can keep up with Speedy. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, good. I want to see this movie again. Released in 1928, Speedy stars Harold Lloyd, Ann Christie, and Burt Woodruff. It was directed by Ted Wilde, and this was his and Harold Lloyd's final silent film. The movie also features a cameo by baseball legend Babe Ruth. Yeah, that's right. At the very first Academy Awards, Ted Wilde was one of two directors nominated for Best Director of a Comedy. He lost to Lewis Milestone, director of Two Arabian Nights. That category did not make a comeback at the second annual Oscars or ever since. For the next 80 or so minutes, you're going to be seeing a lot of drab black and white. So I thought your gift should be something colorful. Jacob's Ladder. This thing, let's see what this is all about. I think I know what it is. There you go. Look at that. Look how much fun you're having. Jacob's Ladder. Oh, your son is going to love that. Yes, he is, and then he's going to break that. (laughs) So you should speed on over to the old leather couch as fast as you can, where we're going to be enjoying Speedy. Albert de Monde is a man of the world, while Walter London is a man of London. And Gaylord Lloyd is a Lloyd of London. Behold, the last horse-drawn streetcar in New York City. A streetcar named... Okay, sure. (laughs) Its owner and proprietor, Pop Dylan. The streetcar company, the non-horse-drawn variety, want to buy him out. But Pop will only sell if they offer him a fair price. A pretty young lady boards the streetcar. That's Pop's daughter, Jane. She's dating a swell fella who just got a new job. Pops isn't so sure about that. That's right, the tumor was baseball sized. <laughs> we didn't know how Speedy lived through it. The New York Yankees are playing a home game. Nowhere in this stadium did anyone say, No more Yankee, my wanky. Harold Speedy Swift is working as a soda jerk. In 1928, the term soda jerk had recently replaced soda rat bastard. <laughs> And the cherry. Do it, Harold. I want to see it. Well, camera trickery. Keaton would have done it in one shot. And he is obsessed with baseball. He even keeps track of their score. Using this classic technique of a donut compartment. We got to bake him some more numbers. This lady orders an orange soda. Orangeade. And that gives Speedy a chance to practice throwing and catching. Pardon me, can you direct me to the... Oh, orange hat. The boss just wants him to go on a brief delivery. He wants these flowers taken to the missus. He goes out in the street with the flowers. There's all kinds of hoo-ha, and the flowers get ruined. Make some new flowers out of pretzels and donuts. He goes back to the Dylan house, and there he meets up with Pops and Jane. Oh, Pop just said a filthy word. 
Four score and seven years ago, I jerked the water. Pop says, say boy, rub my neck for a while. Touch me like you love me, Speedy. Ooh, he's gonna use some Sloan's liniment. <laughs> you wanted this, Pop. Stop squirming around. Let me rub you. W.S. Wilton stops by. He's a big wig at the streetcar company. Howdy, stranger. Care to rub my neck? He wants to buy a pop. Well, I have a price. And he writes it down in a piece of paper. But Speedy sees in the paper these two streetcar companies want to merge, and they can't do that until they buy out all of the little streetcar companies. Pop's concern is a lot more valuable than he thinks. So Speedy amends it with another line. I can't pay you that much. Good day, sir. And I'll get that streetcar line one way or another. Thanks, Warren G. Harding. Don't worry, Pop, I'll go back to the back rub. But he accidentally puts ketchup on instead of the liniment. It's six months until my next bath. How could you? Despite his unemployment, the next day, Speedy buys a new suit and he takes his gal to Coney Island. And that subway sure is crowded. But Speedy finds a creative way to get some seats. He's got the dollar bill on a string trick. Ooh, that was cursing. That was definitely cursing. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw, how dare you? <laughs> they get to Coney Island and they ride on... Oh, what a weird... What oh, is, what is oh, this? Well, Matt, it's kicked in. <laughs> Rides that are bone-breakingly unsafe. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All actors were harmed in the making of this scene. This ride is just tumble down a thing. It cost me 35 cents! Speedy's enjoying his new suit, but everyone keeps messing it up, like dog's paws. If this wasn't a movie, if it was just 1928, he would then just beat the dog to death with a stick. <laughs> and a freshly painted fence. Oh and crap! My jacket! He sees one of those funny mirrors, and everyone seems to be enjoying seeing him in the funny mirror, but they're actually literally laughing behind his back, about his back. And then he does this. You saw that right, folks. Yep. He may as well have given that finger to the Hayes Code. There's an incident with a crab in his pocket. And the crab gets Speedy into a lot of mischief. Ici, la ballon! I will be sent back to my home country because of this. There is much war. Speedy and Jane enter this raffle and they end up winning a bunch of prizes that they have to now lug home. Luckily, Speedy sees a friend with a truck Jimmy Rogers, the singing brakeman. And they give them a lift home. The dog wants to come with. Speedy hops off to get the dog. In the back of the truck, they pretend that this is their new house that they'll live in when they get married. All this time, Pop is sitting home, his neck unrubbed. <laughs> Jane doesn't want to get married yet. She's still worried about Pop and his business dealings. Speedy gets a job as a cabbie. All kinds of cab doings. Oh, my bathtub gin. How will I ever pay the mortgage now? Hey, something smells like my house. I can't, it's far too large. Life isn't fair, princess. And Speedy ends up getting a ticket. Everything's going wrong with this cab. At a nearby orphanage, Babe Ruth is handing out autographed baseballs that will someday be worth a fortune, but they're wasted on these orphans. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> the Bambino is kind to children and he drink a lot. <laughs> he eats so many hot dogs. Babe the Bambino Roof. I need to get to Yankee Stadium like now. Look, it's Babe Ruth. Speedy is so excited. He's starstruck, in fact. So starstruck that he forgets to watch the road. Babe Ruth has a harrowing experience in the back of that cab. It's at this point a stressed out Babe Ruth invents the seatbelt and then forgets about it during his next liquor binge. <laughs> Finally, they get to Yankee Stadium, and Babe Ruth says, Man, I did not like that cab ride, but hey, do you want to come in and see the game? Unfortunately, his boss is also watching the game. You're fired! On his way out, he sees that cop from before because it seems as though there's only 12 people in New York City, except for everyone else. He hides in a phone booth. 
he overhears one of those streetcar men in the phone booth and they say, we know what we can do. And his mind. We're gonna send in this gang to wreck the streetcar. Speedy heads back to Dylan's house. A vacation to a nice island, like say Staten. If you're gonna take the day off tomorrow, I'm gonna ride your bus thing. So what happens at night is that Pop's streetcar is used by all of these local tradesmen to hang out. It's like a clubhouse. They hear about Pop's trouble from Speedy, and they say, We've fought in many wars, and we're going to fight in this war, too. We've got this signal. It smells like rain. And if you tell that to us, we'll help you. Oh, those rage-filled old men. Warms my heart. Speedy is driving the car the next day. All of these tough guys bored. He knows that he's in trouble. So he starts telling people, it smells like rain. Smells like rain. Smells like rain. Smells like rain. It smells like rain. Who's that? Why, it's Babe Ruth. He's come to help out. And there's a rumble. Old man on young thug action. The biggest fight New York has ever seen. With various implements. I love that pre-code sexy action. The laundry man gets into the act and he burns the asses of the bad men. There's the horseshoe guy. There's the sporting goods guys. It's like that. Uh, it's like uh, Warriors. The movie. No, it's not like the movie Warriors. Just never mind. And by the end of the day, dead bodies would litter the street of New York. But that's what happens sometimes when you're an actor. The old man and Speedy, they win the day. Well, none of us will be able to go to work tomorrow and we'll all lose our jobs. Thanks, Speedy. They break into the garage and they steal the streetcar. The dog is there and he has a clue. A pants swatch that was bitten off of the ass of a bad man. I stole this pants, the butt, from some pants. Yeah, it's how kids are wearing it these days. <laughs> There's a message in it. You can figure everything out from there. Kent Avenue, where the whores hang out. Where have you been all night, Speedy? On Kent Avenue with those women? I hesitate to even call them that. Trouser forensics. <laughs> I'll see your two bits and raise you a bit. Twelve and a half cents. He gets the car back. He takes off. And he's got to do a circuit of his route once or else they lose the car because them's the rules. He heads uptown like Ben-Hur. Hold the line. Hold the line. The streetcar crashes. Oh. Oh no, the wheel is broken. They have to improvise a tire with a manhole cover. Makes it all the way around the block, just in time. Pop, your nearly obsolete business has been saved <laughs> for possibly one, maybe two more years. <laughs> Speedy, you've done it. And also you've been drafted by the New York Yankees. Congratulations. <laughs> and that streetcar man comes by and he says, hey, I thought about it and I'm gonna pay you that amount you asked for, $70,000. Speedy says, how about 100,000? Streetcar guy says, you got a deal, because I'm a terrible negotiator. The morning of April 12th, 1994. Niagara Falls! <laughs> Jane can finally get married in Niagara Falls to Speedy. We have watched Speedy, and I am exhausted. <laughs> So much happens in that movie. I don't think it's one movie so much as five or six short films tied together with a plot. So there's the ice cream shop, there's Coney Island, there's the cabbie adventures, there's the old guy street riot, and then there is the race across town. And it does feel very daunting, like a lot has happened in 80 minutes. I said at the beginning, I hope you'll be able to keep up, but that's literally what I had to do. Yes, it's a... Uh, I felt like I was chasing the movie the whole time. There's something about his comedy which seems just a little bit closer to life than his contemporaries Chaplin and Keaton. He seems like a much more real guy, so it seems like there's more on the line. Yeah, he's the most everyman of the silent film stars. If you look at a Keaton fall, he falls perfectly. If you look at Chaplin gliding across the floor on roller skates, it's as though he has like put a little train track on the floor because he's so perfect. Harold Lloyd 
looks sloppy sometimes. He's a klutz. Yeah, he's a klutz. There's one scene where everything just calms down and nothing much happens and it's not funny at all, but it's lovely. It's the moving van sequence where they just take a bunch of stuff and they make a home that they've never been able to afford before. If that was Keaton, he'd have a bunch of like gadgetries, you know, little Rube Goldberg devices to make it all happen. If it was Chaplin, it would be just so sentimental. But poetic. And poetic, while this was just authentic. Just a man, he's not aspiring to be rich, he's just aspiring to be middle class. Just a guy with a fire, a dog, and a wife. I thought that dog was pretty great. <laughs> Yeah. Good movie dog. The shot where Harold jumps off, picks up the dog, and runs. That's a well-trained dog to just be like, all right, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine with this whole situation. The location photography is gorgeous, of course. This is one of the best documentaries about New York. Yeah. It's one of those movies like The French Connection, which just captures a certain moment in New York history and does it perfectly. This French Connection, Naked City, probably the three best. Well, that would be a, a great film festival. A movie like this from each decade of the 20th century. Oh, yeah. You could do it. So I have some fun facts about this movie. Good. Harold Lloyd's real-life nickname was Speedy. Oh. It was given to him by his father. And that streetcar crash was real. That actually happened. Not in the script? Not in the script. <laughs> and they had to improvise the whole manhole cover wheel thing. You know that Harold Lloyd only had like seven and a half fingers at this point in his life, right? No, I didn't know that. Just like his characters, Harold Lloyd seems to be something of God's fool. He had a prop bomb that he lit during a photo shoot, and he didn't realize that it was actually had gunpowder in it. Oh, yeah. Blew off three of his fingers. Wow. This was before Safety Last. He did all of those climbs with only one and a half hands. How did you feel about the acting talents of Babe Ruth? <laughs> He was fine. He's at least as good as Lance Armstrong and Dodgeball. <laughs> the weird thing about that scene is that they do the same scene twice in the row. First with the old man in the back, and then they put Babe Ruth in the back. It did feel like an overstuffed movie. They could have lost one comic set piece. <laughs> when I was a kid, a friend of mine told me that if Babe Ruth struck out, it would count as three outs. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever he went up to bat, if he didn't hit that ball, it would just be out for the entire... The whole inning's over! Because Babe Ruth was that good. And you believed this for how long? I don't know. 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've sped through Speedy, and now it's time for us to speed on over to Scenit. Fran Newhouse writes, Have you seen the Buddy Holly story from 1978 with Gary Busey? I think this is a fun rock and roll movie. But that's just the opinion of me, a living, breathing human. <laughs> seen it. Not seen it. I always meant to, but never got around to it. There are three extraordinary things about this movie. All of the actors played their instruments and sang. Busey, Charles Martin Smith, and the third guy, I think he was in American Graffiti. Two, all the musical numbers were done live in front of a live audience. And three, because the director wanted authenticity, he would only do two takes of any scene. Busey and the boys are messing up left and right. They're hitting sour notes. Busey is switching verses around. Watching him perform, he looks terrified because he's concentrating so much on trying to do this right because he's only got two shots. <laughs> so it gives the movie a really loose feel that's fun, infectiously fun. If I had that director doing that story in that way to me, I'd think, I'm going to get in that plane and he's going to kill me. He wants this thing to feel real. Will Prechuk writes, I just saw Cleo from 5 to 7, and it showed a whole new side of the French New Wave. It tackles both societal expectations of women in the late 60s, as well as the power of film and art against tough situations in life. Seen it. Seen it as well. This is Agnes Varda's first full-length movie. Wow, that's unbelievable. Yeah, and it is a movie... It's told in real time from five to seven. Yeah. It's told in real space. You can actually do Cleo's walk around Paris. And the plot of the movie is so tense, even though nothing happens in it. Because what Cleo is waiting for, at seven o'clock, she's going to find out if she has cancer. And everything in the movie is life or death. Even today, you can really feel the freshness and the vitality of these new ideas that are coming out of France. And it's really exciting to watch. And uh, I like her apartment filled with kittens. There's that song she sings in one take in the movie. Yeah. 
And it just starts out as just some blah French pop song. And she gets to a point in the song where she's singing with such passion. It's almost terrifying. Wilson Douglas McDonald, Cool Hand Luke, seen it. Sometimes a nothing hand is a seen it. This is a movie about nonconformity, and it's a movie about not losing hope even when all hope is lost. Yeah. And it's a very 60s movie, but it's also very much a guy movie. No, it is maybe the most guy movie ever made. Yeah. So many people in this. Uh, Dennis Hopper mm -hmm. is in this. Harry. Wayne Wayne Rogers from MASH. Harry Dean Stanton. Yeah, yeah. Russell Qualls writes, Seen it? Green for Danger. Generally regarded as one of the best book-to-film adaptations of the golden age of detective stories. Seen it? Seen it. I was very surprised at the opening credits of this. It said, Introducing Alistair Sim. Yeah. You would never know that he hadn't been acting in front of a camera for the last 20 years. Yeah. He just, he instantly, he knows exactly what to do. It's a weird lead performance because he doesn't show up in the first 40 minutes of the movie. Before he shows up, the movie's pretty dry. Dry as a bone. Yes. And then there's the weird thing of Dr. Eden, who's supposed to be this ladies' man. All the ladies love Dr. Eden. Dr. Eden is a rather homely-looking fellow. <laughs> He's slightly more attractive than Mr. Bean. Leo Gen is not an ugly man. I didn't say he was ugly. Yeah, he is. He's fine-looking. Uh, you have to keep in mind that his character is also rich. Yeah. That makes you a lot more attractive. It's a pleasure to watch him in bed reading a murder mystery, suddenly realizing he knows how it ends, <laughs> flip to the ending, realizing that he was wrong and just being sad. There's a place you can go where you can speed through it or take your time, and that's our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. There are all of our episodes there, over 200 of them, and there are PayPal donation buttons you can click on to help to support this show. So many generous folks have done this, and we appreciate it. We do appreciate it. Donors such as Eric, who says thanks again for all your hard work, and Justin and Sabrina. My fiance and I are separated by the Atlantic Ocean, and we're supposed to get married here in the U.S. where I live in Florida. Obviously the plague, thankfully not caused by those evil bats has put the kibosh on that. But one thing we've discovered during the long lockdown kept the parties are wonderful and insightful film criticism slash comedy show. We have found watching all your back catalog and looking forward to new episodes is a small thing that helps bridge the distance. Uh, that's very sweet. Um, Justin or Sabrina, whoever wrote this. One of their favorite and underappreciated indie filmmakers is Hal Hartley. Are you familiar with his work? Yes. Well, uh, Justin, I, I'm just going to say that this is Justin. I recommend several Hal Hartley films for us to check out. Cheers from Florida and Manchester. To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the exciting contents of our mail crate, you can watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. Thank you for sitting down with us and watching Speedy, and now watch this. Do it! That movie can't be 35 years old. My math isn't right there. 84? Or 85, yeah. Well, one of those two years. Yeah, that's 35 years. The movie is older than Amadeus lived to be. What was he, 33? 32? Ask Falco. Okay. Okay.